Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. But for a few inches, neither of us would be here today. An ex-correction officer now behind bars himself. We'll take you to the sentencing of the Ohio man and show you the shocking video as he shoots at a deputy. Plus... Hello, hello, and good morning. <laughs> it is really nice and sunny today. A 22-year-old woman vanishes from a cross-country road trip with her boyfriend. The surprising location where the couple's van was found. And the jury is now deliberating in the Robert Durst trial. Hear the heated back and forth between Durst's prosecution and the trial judge. Now you are treading on, on, on ice, thin ice. But first, federal charges against Derek Chauvin, convicted murderer of the late George Floyd. The ex-police officer's plea before a federal... Crime Daily, I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. We begin with a major update in the federal prosecution for the death of George Floyd. Four Minnesota police officer Derek Chauvin and three other ex-officers are pleading not guilty to federal civil rights charges. Chauvin and the other ex-officers, Tu Tao, J. Alexander King, and Thomas Lane made their appearance in federal court on Tuesday in Minnesota. They're facing charges of depriving George Floyd of his constitutional rights back in May of 2020. In June of this year, Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison in connection to the murder of George Floyd. On Tuesday, Chauvin appeared in court virtually from Oak Park Heights Correctional Facility. His three former colleagues all appeared in person and are out on $25,000 bond. In a separate incident, Chauvin is also accused of holding a 14-year-old boy by the throat and hitting him multiple times in the head with a flashlight. A federal hearing is scheduled on Thursday where Chauvin will be arraigned for that separate incident. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Bernardo Violona and Terry Austin. Bernardo, one of the many motions argued today was that the three officers should have a separate trial from Chauvin. They were successful in the state case. Will they be here? So, Brian, it's going to be a lot of arguments in regards to having a separate trial. Obviously, it benefits each of the officers, formal officers, if their trials were severed from each other, because you're not going to have so much damaged evidence in terms of everything and every last bit of what Derek Chauvin did. Now, I don't know if they're going to be successful, though, with the federal case, because one thing that they have to determine, the judge is going to have to determine, is that are there statements against any one of these officers that they actually made against each other that will require them to have a separate trial? So that is going to be one of the elements that's going to be evaluated heavily to make that determination. Yeah, it's not quite sure whether or not there's an antagonistic defense which make it easier to separate. Uh, Terry, with Showen serving time on the state case, two federal cases against him coming up, and a tax evasion case, should we expect pleas or trials from him? You know, Brian, this could go either way. He's going to be in jail in any case for, you know, 22 and a half years because he's already been convicted of the murder of George Floyd. But his other two federal cases and this tax case really do present some complicated problems for him. And I think he's going to have to coordinate things. We've already heard that there was some talk before, failed talk, about a plea deal. We could hear about that again. But my view is, if that plea deal fails and he doesn't reach an agreement with the prosecution on the federal cases, either one of them, the 2020 George Floyd or the 14-year-old boy, I think he's going to fight, and I think he's going to fight hard. He could probably settle the tax claim. Yeah, we know he was trying to get his time served in a federal penitentiary rather than state, as many officers do when they're sentenced. Maybe that may be the crux to taking a plea or going to trial. We'll check it out later. Turning now to Ohio, where a man who tried to kill a sheriff's deputy learns his punishment. Law and Crime's Angela Levy shows us the video of the incident and what the deputy says about nearly being killed. A doorbell camera recorded this incident at a home outside of Cincinnati back in February. Warren County Sheriff's Deputy Sarah Vaught narrowly escaped being killed. Here he is, here he is. Deputy Vaught and others went to the home of 57-year-old Lance Runyon, checking on him at the request of family members. Since the shooting, Vaught says she has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. She says she still doesn't understand why Lance Runyon tried to kill her. I have dealt with hundreds of people in crisis during my 12 years on patrol. Intoxicated people, suicidal people, 
people in psychosis, people whose children I am taking away, people who have committed terrible crimes and are facing long prison sentences, people who were all of those things at the same time. And Lance Runyon is the only one that has tried to kill me. Runyon is an ex-corrections officer and teacher with no criminal record. His attorney says he doesn't remember the incident. Deputies shot Runyon and then raced to help him. He spoke briefly before learning his punishment. <laughs> Sorry that it happened. It's not because I'm in trouble, but because for everybody. A judge sentenced Lance Runyon to a total of 17 years in prison. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. Thank you, Anjanette. Turning now to the East Coast, where the first trial is underway in the so-called Operation Varsity Blues scandal. It alleges parents bought their children's acceptance letters into top universities. The case rose to fame in 2019 after upwards of 50 people were arrested for their involvement. Notably, celebrities Lori Laughlin and Felicity Huffman were convicted for participating. In the scheme that traded thousands of dollars for their child's admissions to college, officials say that between 2011 and 2018, parents doled out $25 million to admissions consultant Rick Singer, the mastermind behind the conspiracy. Singer then used some of those funds to bribe college officials, flub test scores, and create fictional collegiate sports recruits. The trial opened on Monday in Boston's federal court, where the defendants, a former casino executive and former GAP COO, claimed that they were duped by Singer, believing their donations were going directly to the universities. The trial is expected to last several weeks. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, famed R&B singer R. Kelly on trial in a federal arena. We'll break down the gripping testimony. But first, Elizabeth Holmes back in court. The unexpected break from the federal case against a former billionaire still ahead. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. The federal case against Elizabeth Holmes was back in session Tuesday after a brief recess due to a juror's exposure to COVID-19. In Tuesday's testimony, former Theranos employees detailed the hundreds of millions of dollars the company lost over the years. Holmes faces 12 fraud charges stemming from her times as CEO of Theranos. The Stanford dropout founded the company at age 19, claiming it would revolutionize blood testing. But later, investigations found there were many issues with that process. Last week, the trial was put on hold after a juror voiced concern about a COVID-19 exposure. This week, the juror took back-to-back -to -back negative COVID tests. With court back in session, the jury heard from a former Theranos controller who said the company deficit ran upwards of $376 million by 2014. Tuesday marked day two of testimony in the trial that is expected to last for weeks. Switching gears now to the sex trafficking trial against R. Kelly, the federal trial continues with more testimony from uncharged accusers and employees of the disgraced king of R&B. Before testimony began, there was a major ruling in the government's favor that may lead the jury to hear from R. Kelly without him taking the stand. The judge ruled that pieces of a video and audio recording will come in with R. Kelly berating Jane Doe 20 for allegedly stealing from R. Kelly. In the recordings, he screams, if you lie to me, I'm going to F you up. But as the prosecution tried to admit the recordings into evidence, Jane Doe 20 had a panic attack. Now, the government says that for the sake of her mental health, they would not call her back as a witness in the trial. Then, another Jane Doe, Angela, testified that, along with being sexually abused by the singer as a teenager, she also walked in on R. Kelly giving oral sex to then-teenager Aaliyah, testimony that went to show the continued sexual abuse of minors by the R&B singer. The second male accuser, who testified as Alex, but R. Kelly nicknamed Nephew, told the Brooklyn federal jury of the sexual relationship he and R. Kelly shared. Alex explained that he met Kelly through the first male accuser, Lewis, when he was 16, and he too was part of Kelly's basketball crew. But his relationship did not become sexual till he was 20, when Kelly pushed himself onto Alex, saying, have an open mind. 
From there, Alex testified that he and Kelly would have sexual encounters, often with women that he did not know and looked zombie-ish. R. Kelly would allegedly record Alex and the women having sex to his instructions. Sometimes he would just watch and other times he would join. The defense pushed back on Alex's testimony, asking why he simply told federal authorities he worked for R. Kelly. Before defense attorney Deborah Kanick could cut him off, Alex said he had been brainwashed for so long. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Bernardo Villalona and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, in what has been described as an emotional breakdown, Jane Doe 20 will not be called to testify again. Does this mean the video and audio recording won't be played for the jury? The video and audio should be played, Brian. There's no question about that. I think it will be admitted into evidence. They only need to show two things, that it was authenticated and that there was the chain of custody from the beginning of the creation of the video. The authentica authentication has to show someone who was in the video to really basically say that it depicts who it purports to show. And so if they can get Uncle George, who apparently was there, or an engineer, they won't need Jane Doe number 20. And the chain of custody should be fairly easy to establish from the origins of the tape and then when it was subpoenaed and when it was located and the transmission of the tape subsequent to that. So I think they should be able to get it into evidence. Absolutely. Maybe we'll see some last minute subpoenas to do just as you described, uh, Terry, because that seems to be the best route for the government now. Bernard, control over Jane Doe's, John Doe's, and his employees. What does Alex and Angela's testimony give to the prosecution in terms of an enterprise under the RICO Act? So, Brian, what we've heard from, from these last couple of weeks from these women from who were teenagers at the time, as well as from males that were teenagers at the time, what it has proven and has shown is that R. Kelly had a decade, decades of predatory behavior, and it did not just exist with young female girls, but also with males. What this has gone to show and what is so troubling to me, Brian, is a testimony that we heard from yesterday from Angela that she said that poor Aaliyah, that we all have come to know from growing up with her music, that she walked into the room. And when she walked into the room, she saw this grown man, R. Kelly, in his 20s, performing oral sex on Aaliyah, who was between the ages of 12 and 14 at the time. What that testimony did is that it solidified the RICO Act, RICO Act number one, that pertains to Aaliyah in this case. But, Brian, I mean, all this testimony that we're receiving, you see the same pattern, same pattern, same pattern, and that's the control that R. Kelly exercised over his employees, over these young girls, over these guys, and that they were all scared of doing anything different to disobey this predator. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Bernardo and Terry. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the jury enters deliberation in the trial of California versus Robert Durst. Plus, a New York woman missing for weeks after a trip across the country with her boyfriend. The last video she posted to her social media before she vanished. Welcome back. On to our top legal news. A nationwide search is underway for a missing 22-year-old woman after she left for a cross-country road trip with her boyfriend. I think our plan for today is to just hang out here in the tent. Um, Brian's stretching, doing some morning yoga. Officials say Gabrielle Petito of Suffolk County, New York, is believed to have been at Grand Tenton National Park in Wyoming. She detailed her trip with a video posted to YouTube showing her traveling with a man named Brian in a white van. Officials say the van was found in Florida at her boyfriend's parents' home. Police say he was not missing, but did not say where he is or whether he may be involved in the disappearance. Petito's mother says she last received text messages from Petito at the end of August, but can't confirm it was her because she didn't speak via the phone. Petito is described as being a white woman with blonde hair, 5 feet 5 inches tall, and about 110 pounds. Anyone with more information should contact Crime Stoppers. The number is at the bottom of your screen. And in New Hampshire, crucial updates for the family of Mara Murray, who went missing back in 2004. Murray was seen by a motorist after she crashed her car in February 2004. The police initially treated it as a missing persons case before handing it over to the New Hampshire Cold Case Division. 
17 years later, her family reported bone fragments found at a popular ski resort in the area to law enforcement. Testing is currently being done to the discovered bone fragments as the investigation remains to be ongoing. An update now on the story we've been following. Singer Rod Stewart will avoid jail time as a Florida judge cancels his trial and schedules a plea hearing instead. The trial was set to begin Tuesday in Florida. You may remember Stewart and his adult son, Sean Stewart, faced charges of battery stemming from a 2019 altercation. Authorities say Stewart and his son were involved in a physical fight with a security guard on New Year's Eve of that year. Last week, Stewart's can't reach a deal with prosecutors. The famed Maggie May singer and his son are expected to appear in a final hearing late October. On to Texas, where police say a shocking murder-suicide took place in the lobby of a Houston hotel. Police say 27-year-old Jenna Sonderberg was shot and killed by her longtime boyfriend, 39-year-old Sherrick Bird, at a Marriott Marquis on September 7th. Witnesses say they saw the couple arrive at the hotel and heard gunshots just moments later. Officials believe the pair were planning to check into the hotel at the time of the shooting. According to court documents, Sonderberg had filed multiple reports between 2018 and 2019 alleging Bird was physically abusive. When we come back, the jury has to deliberation in the trial of California versus Robert Durst. We'll hear the heated back and forth between the judge and the prosecution. All of that and more next. Welcome back. After months in the courtroom, the jury is finally deliberating the fate of accused murderer and real estate heir, Robert Durst. Durst is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, who was discovered with a bullet wound in her head in her Benedict Canyon home back in 2000. The real estate heir's trial has been ongoing for nearly four months after previously being paused for the pandemic. The defense wrapped up their closing arguments on Monday, but before court resumed, prosecutor John Lewin voiced his opinion on evidence from Durst Gabelson trial, where he was acquitted of the murder of his neighbor, Morris Black. In a heated back and forth, the judge snapped back at the prosecutor. Now here's the problem, Your Honor. He does not have the legal right or the authority or the position as an attorney to tell the jury that evidence that the court has admitted was admitted improperly. And that's what he said. That's number one. Number two. I, I, th I really, I take it to mean it was presented for that reason, but, not that it was, ad not that I admitted but, it for but, that but, reason, because he should be attacking me. But, but you, you're attacking Your Honor, you can, yes. if you want to twist his words to, to come up with an innocent intent, if you want to basically say. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lewin, do not say that the court is twisting what, a party's words. Yeah. Now you are treading on, on, on ice, thin ice. Well, Your Honor, I'm trying to make. My point is simple. He says, in my opinion, based on the evidence, Galveston shouldn't be admitted in this case. As the defense wrapped up their closing argument, they addressed perhaps the biggest elephant in the room, the testimony from one of Robert Durst's closest friends, Nick Shaven, who claims that Durst confessed to murdering Susan Berman, saying, quote, it was her or me. I had no choice. I want, I want to leave you with the following. I want, I want you to imagine that one of your relatives is very sick in the hospital. And they're basically on life support. And a decision has to be made as to whether or not you say enough is enough. So you're going to rely heavily on what the doctor says. And you walk into the room to talk to the doctor. And the doctor is Nick Chavin. Would you rely on Nick Chavin to decide that important issue in your life? Or would you run from the hospital room? Following the state's closing arguments, prosecutor John Lewin began his rebuttal, pointing out all of the evidence that his team has presented. About the only thing that we have not given you in this case is literally a videotape of the murder. It's about the only thing we haven't given you. Um, defense says, well, you don't have any physical evidence. What physical evidence would you expect? What are you going to get? Bob Durst goes in, very likely wearing gloves, and executes her in the back of the head and leaves. 
He's admitted that he was touching phones, et cetera, and there's no fingerprints. What does that mean? The only reasonable inference is he's wearing gloves. You would expect him to be wearing gloves because Bob Durst went down there knowing exactly what he was going to do. Bernard Lewin seems to have this case all wrapped up with the judge, but could this skating on thin ice affect the trial? Well, what we're hoping, one, is that none of this has been done in front of the jury, because you don't want the jury to be affected by the back and forth and sometimes being disrespectful to the judge. Let that affect their decision making in this case. But you got to think that they've been going on at it for months, months. They have such a close relationship because they've spent so many hours together. So I think people are getting underneath each other's skin. But you got to remember in the end that Judge Wyndham, he's the judge. Exactly. Terry, during Lewin's rebuttal, he mentioned the witnesses, the witness killing special circumstances charge. Do you think he explained it well enough to the jury? I do, and it was a good idea that he did. These special circumstance allegations of killing a witness and also of lying in wait had to be explained because most people think a witness is someone who witnessed a murder. But here it means someone who would have been a witness in the prosecution of the case. And Lewin also explained that lying in wait doesn't necessarily mean you have to be behind a closed door. It just means that you are trying to hide the circumstances and the fact that you have this murderous intent. So good explanation by Lewin. Yeah, and probably one that needed to be made because it's not just a plain language there. It's a little bit more than that. Thank you both. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.